is so good to connect with you online. Thanks for joining us. My name is Steve McCready and I am the outgoing senior pastor here at Faith St. Thomas. If you are new to our online community or our city, I would love to connect with you and help you get connected to our team of pastors and elders and the amazing volunteer leaders of Faith St. Thomas. We want you to feel welcome and we want to be able to help you and encourage you during this ongoing pandemic. You can connect with us online on social media, by email, or give the office a call. This summer, I am teaching a series that I have called Seven Pieces of My Heart. When Rebecca and I were young parents, we were given an amazing opportunity to take a trip to preach and teach in Beirut in Lebanon. Now we had grown up in a war-torn country, and so the thought of going to Beirut really didn't scare us at all. But we did think probably wasn't a good idea to take our little two-year-old Isabella with us. So we arranged for her to stay with her grandparents and Rebecca and I went through all the emotions of leaving her at home for the very first time. Now Rebecca, who is the amazing gift giver in our family, organized something really special for Isabella. She decided to buy and wrap a special gift from mom and dad that would be opened each day while we were gone. So Granny Dirdry would bring out the gift and read the little love letter that went along with it from mom and dad. So that Isabella would know that even though we were really far away, that we loved her and that we were thinking of her and hopefully she would think of us too. This series is really a part of my heart and I want to leave that part behind with this amazing community in Faith St. Thomas. So each week I'm unwrapping an idea that I think is so incredibly important, but also comes from a place of love. Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about having a repentant heart, being people who have a repentant posture. We've talked about seeking to discover the holy burden that God places in our lives. And last week we talked about having a bold and courageous faith. Today, as we continue this series and the accompanying study that goes along with it in the book of Nehemiah, the piece of my heart that I want to leave with you is this. Real faith requires real action and real action can mean hard work. Sometimes following Jesus means rolling up our sleeves and getting our hands dirty. In the story of Nehemiah, after the plans have been made for rebuilding the walls, the resources have been collected and gathered, and a vision for the work has been cast, it's time for the people to move from faith to action. And we come in our story to Nehemiah chapter three, and hopefully you've had a chance to read it this week. And yes, it's a long and potentially boring record of the account of the rebuilding of the walls. There in his memoir, Nehemiah details down all the names of all the builders and their work on the wall. Now this, for the most part, is builder-builder talk. This is like when you talk low German so that the kids don't understand what you're saying. Or when a group of teachers get together, start to get excited talking about curriculum and differentiation or learning styles. Here in this passage, is a story about builders and so it's used using that builder language. When builders get together and they start talking about construction projects, those of us who are not handy, we tend to zone out. Lots of us zone out when we read Nehemiah 3, and understandably so, but contained within this long construction report, some really helpful stuff for us today. So that's what I wanna talk about this morning. I wanna share a few of those helpful things with you. And the first is this, our faith must be modeled for others to see. People don't see what we believe. They see how we believe. They see the actions of our faith. In the story of rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls, the first people out of the gate, and you'll pardon the Bible pun, were the priests and the Levites. Our faith doesn't just demand action, it's demonstrated by action. These holy men couldn't call people to a life of worship in Jerusalem if Jerusalem continued to lie in ruins, but they also couldn't call people to a rebuilding project that they were not willing to get involved in themselves. You know, when I was a young Christian, there was one rock band that ruled the Christian airwaves. It was DC Talk. And this band were famous for songs like Jesus Freak, remember that one, and Colored People. But it was their song, What Have I Stumble, that I remember most. And the opening lyrics of that song that I remember challenging me, just rattling me as a young Christian. They say the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. 
who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, I've been a Christian for a very long time, over 20 years, and I have to say that I think the guys in DC Talk were right. People don't really care what we believe. What they pay attention to is how we live. Here in Nehemiah 3, we have this great illustration of what spiritual leadership looks like. It looks like imitative faith. It looks like some professional holy men who are not willing to ask people to participate in something that they are not willing to do themselves. Another interesting part of Nehemiah's building notes is that the rebuilding project is bringing together a community of people who are coming from different experiences, different backgrounds, different professions, and very different socioeconomic statuses, even different theology. But something special happens. Everyone pitches in. Nehemiah records that the high priest even put on his work clothes, that there were artisans like goldsmiths and beauticians, the perfume makers, that women were working on the walls, and even people from out of town came to get involved in the project. What an inspiring example of what can be done when God's people work together under dynamic leadership. One noticeable comment is found in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 5, where we are told that the nobles of Tekoa were not willing to help. These were the wealthy, aristocratic, celebrity families of their day. And yet they're only remembered in history for what they didn't do, not what they did. And Nehemiah, he's very clever in how he writes. He contrasts these money people, these early influencers, these elitists, with the ordinary blue collar working class people of Tekoa, who were so dedicated that they did extra work, working twice as hard as everyone else and being worthy of an extra mention in the record. Status and position, it turns out, are no measure of character and authenticity. One final thing I want to mention about Nehemiah's detailed account is that the work was hard. It was heavy lifting. It was construction work in the Middle Eastern heat under the Middle Eastern sun with limited tools, very limited experience, and the money was terrible. The hours were long. The cultural pressure to quit was real. But under a dynamic leadership team, including Nehemiah and Ezra, the people responded and they did the work. This somewhat boring Bible passage about a bunch of construction in a war-torn city has some really important things to say to us about our lives and our mission today. In God's great rebuilding work, everyone is invited to participate. When we came to Faith St. Thomas six years ago, alongside the elders, we had a very clear vision for this church, that we would be a community of participation. We didn't want to be a church that people came to, where they just attended, but rather one to which they belonged and were joined together in the great work of the commission of God. We cast a vision that was to see every member of the Faith St. Thomas community being equipped and sent on mission to St. Thomas and Elgin County, seeking first his kingdom. In short, and you'll know this, our vision was to see everyone equipped, everyone engaged. Our vision was like that in Nehemiah, everyone taking their place on the wall, using their gifts and talents and passions and creativity and experience and heart to build together. There is work for everyone to do. Everyone is invited, everyone is called. It might be youth ministry, or car park duty, or worship teams, or community projects like the Grace Cafe or In Out of the Cold. There is somewhere on the wall that has your name, the name of your family, written on it. Let's get to work. For the Christian, all work is holy, and holiness is work. The beauty of this story in Nehemiah 3 is of a team of people coming together to do a great work, a holy work, a work that has been ordained by God. But it wasn't packaged with holy language and it wasn't hyper-spiritualized. It was gritty, it was sweaty, but it was also holy. This work on the walls for the priests was as holy as their work at the altar. 
This project happens right at the intersection of the sacred and the secular. The lines are blurred, and in that space, the community flourishes. I think that many of us have grown up with a very compartmentalized approach to faith and to God. This is holy, this is not. This is part of my Christian life, this is my other life. And this story encourages us that God doesn't think about our lives in this way, with these defining lines. The walls needed to be rebuilt to restore the honor of God's name, but they also needed to be rebuilt to provide safety for the inhabitants of the city. This project was holy and practical. It was sacred and secular. It was ordinary people doing ordinary work, but it was also extraordinary faith-filled people serving an extraordinary God. The last thing that I want to say is that sometimes God asks us to do hard things. Last week, I was sitting at a campfire with some friends and we were doing that thing that middle-aged people do. We were retelling stories from our childhood. Our friends had grown up working on the farms of Southwest Ontario. As he told Rebecca and I stories of picking cucumbers and peppers in these big fields under the sun from the ages of 11 and 12 years old, I was aware that these guys had learned how to work so hard. They didn't choose it, but they did it because they needed to. They had to take their place and their part in their family. You know, at a time when professional life around the world has changed, with automation and technology and research into health and even effectiveness, you know, the future looks like working from home. For many people, it will be a four-day week. The, the cultural narrative can shape our understanding that following God should maybe be less invasive, less demanding. And truthfully, I think there's some, there's some good in that. I think sometimes religion can mean religious activity and meaningless religious activity leading to burnout and disillusionment. And I don't believe God is a hard taskmaster or a slave driver because the entire biblical narrative would stand against that type of God. Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is the God of Israel who breaks the yoke of slavery, who invites his people to a place of rest, who gives the gift of Sabbath. But with that all said, he is still in the business of asking us to do hard things, things that cost things that push us, things that challenge us, and like we mentioned last week, things that scare us. Four years ago, I was sitting on a little wall in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. I was in this old stone wall, sitting, gazing into the olive olive trees, and I was remembering the story of Jesus in John 17, and I was caught up in a holy moment of imagining that moment in the garden when the father asked the son to choose Calvary and the cross. See, the hardest thing of all was the cross of Christ. And we won't be asked to do that, but we are asked to take up our cross. What does that mean for you? What parts of your life do you need to lay down? What things do you need to take up? What causes, what concerns? Now, why is this a piece of my heart? Because this vision to see everyone equipped and everyone engaged, that's my dream for local churches. I'm often asked, what's your vision for the church? And it's simple. I would love to see churches become communities of peace. People who come together and find a way to do life together marked by peace. And secondly, that they would be communities of presence, a group of people who are marked by the very presence of God, God at the center, the reality of God's presence and the power of worship, but also in the simplicity of welcome. But the big one for me is that churches are places of participation, of a people living out of faith that others can follow. And that's the piece of my heart that I wanted to leave with you today. Let's get to work.